All right. Hi, everybody. For those who don't know me, my name is Janae Bennett, and I'm the foster director with Dow's Pets Alive. Welcome to our wonderful cat behavior workshop with Molly DeVos. Molly is amazing. And today's topic is litter box issues, which I think is amazing for our fosters and our adopters. Adopters, and then all of you guys who are not with DPA, even if your cat doesn't have litter box issues, you never know when something like that could happen. So a little bit about DPA is we are located in uh, North Texas out of DFW. We um, mainly service the Dallas Animal Shelter, Mesquite, Irving, Garland, and recently Waxahachie shelters. We're branching out to help some of those smaller shelters in our area because um, we have the capacity to, and why not? So, uh, DPA, like I said, started in 2012. This is our 10 year anniversary year. And we started out as a mainly dog rescue. And then in 2015, there was someone convinced someone to bring in a litter of kittens. So we had six cats, five kittens, and one adult cat. And since 2015, our cat program has grown and grown every year. Um, in 2020, we had 429 cats either adopted out or transported. And um, in 2020, we realized we need to focus more on helping our cat fosters. And so we started a section of our su support squad to help our cat fosters. And that's how we got Molly involved last year. And ever since then, I, it's been awesome. Our cat fosters are feeling supported and we keep getting more of them. Great. You guys do awesome work. <laughs> thank you. You do too, Molly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, you done? You, by the way, and for those of you that, that may not be in Dallas or, or no, DPA, by the way, stands for Dallas Pets Alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're a wonderful group, wonderful, wonderful group and wonderful to have me quarterly doing these topics and be sure if you have any suggestions for topics, be sure to send them in because um, we'd love to have that. All right, now I will just jump right in here. Let me start by sharing my screen with you. Okay, and then we'll get started. And, uh, and Janae, if you'll, um, if you'll go ahead and admit anybody else that comes in late, that would be great. Got it. Okay, so um, a, a little bit about me, actually, for those of you who, who don't know me, um, I'm a certified feline training and behavior specialist, and I'm a certified cat behavior consultant. I'm a fear-free certified trainer, and I'm also a certified Reiki master, and I, I use my Reiki on cats, both cats that I uh, foster that may be having physical ailments, as well as cats that are having some stress issues and emotional issues in shelters and cats that I visit for nail trims and home consults and, and things like that. I find it's a, it's a very good natural energy healing method that helps cats to just feel better all the way around. People too, but I just do cats. So <laughs> after being in Dallas Animal Services for so long, Dallas Animal Services is the third largest shelter in our nation. And uh, we admit over when I joined that couples group, 40,000. If you're on so kid, you can mute. I mean, yeah, if you're on mute yourself, unless you have a question. And I think this will go pretty fast today and we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards, by the way. But after being in Dallas Animal Services and seeing, you know, the cats that are at most risk in a shelter other than underage kittens are cats with behavior issues. And it's not uncommon for a cat in a shelter to be extremely stressed for a variety of reasons and 38% of cats surrendered into shelters is because of behavior issues. So I decided to start a nonprofit, Cat Behavior Solutions, focused on shelter diversion, supplying information to cat owners and shelters and volunteers across the world so that more cats can stay in their home and they're not doing those things that people find offensive. And then I also 
started um, Cat Talk Radio, and that's a weekly podcast that we do. And um, it has all kinds of, you know, topics on anything. I mean, you name it, we're on our 166th, I think, podcast. So just about anything you can think of, you can find on Cat Talk Radio. So check that out. We're easy to find. We're on every uh, iTunes, Spotify, all of that. So today's agenda, first of all, I, I want to, uh, to say, Janae had said, even if you're not having litter box issues, which is really important, and I probably should have titled this decoding litter box issues, or, you know, you can help other people with litter box issues with what I'm going to teach you today. And I want to tell you that when I was going through my certification programs, I was not having litter box issues. I had a cat prior to Pico who lived to be 16, died of, of cancer. And um, he did not go outside that litter box for his entire time. I mean, up until the day he died, I, the moment he died, he had not gone outside the litter box. And I was using uh, a litter box system that is not within the rules. And I thought, well, how can this be? My cat's never gone outside the litter box. Why would I want to do all this inconvenient stuff for me? And I thought, well, I'll try it and just see what happened. And the really weird thing happened. He got more friendly. And I was very surprised that his affection level actually increased. And that was the only thing that had changed was the litter box setup. So it may be causing your cat some stress if you're not doing some of the things that we're talking about today. And you may find that if you do some of these things, you may actually have a happier cat. So even if you're not having litter box issues, take note. So we're gonna cover natural behaviors. We're gonna cover urine versus defecation because those are two really different things. If your cat's peeing or pooping outside the litter box, kind of two different topics in a lot of ways. Urine versus spraying, again, two different things. Um, what are the main causes? And we're gonna talk about correction approach to each of those causes and issues and treatment plan for each of those causes. So let's start with how cats go in the wild. And this is really important. I talk about what cats do in the wild a lot in my consults and all my seminars. And the reason is because they still share a 96% DNA link with their wildcat ancestors. In fact, they say that if you take a cat's jaw and his teeth and you blow it up really big, it's identical to a tiger. You can't, you can't see a difference. They have not evolved all that much physically one of the biggest ways they've involved is the front, frontal lobe of their brain has shrunk about 30%. And that doesn't mean that they're less intelligent. That's where fear is controlled. So they're able to actually live with people and not be quite as, as fearful as their wildcat ancestors. So it's real important that we try to mimic what happens in the wild for cats in our homes. If we're gonna keep them inside which we strongly recommend you do. So that's why I wanted to start here with how cats go in the wild. So as you can see, these two outdoor kittens here, they're going in an open area. Cats don't go into caves or holes or, you know, under bushes and quiet places. They go out in the open. And the reason they do that is because they're both predator and prey. So they've got to be on the lookout for coyotes and hawks and all kinds of things to attack them. And there's no time that they're more vulnerable than when they're trying to take a dump. So <laughs> they don't wanna go somewhere they can't see what's coming. They're gonna go out in the wild. The other thing, and we just talked about, is their hypervigilance. They're always hypervigilant. And this is something in a, in a cat's behavior um, that's important to remember. Even your most confident, laid back, relaxed cat has a level of hypervigilance going on because they are both predator and prey. And so that's real important when you're thinking about how they go in the wild and how they want to go in your home. They usually go in a softer substrate. 
um, the cat on the right that's going in the sand, that would be their preference. On a beach would be a cat's heaven litter box. But if not, then it's usually in areas where there's something loose that they can cover up. Under, 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 under. So let's talk about urine versus defecation. The urine issues are much more common. I see, you know, for litter box issues, 99% of my cases are, are urine versus defecation. And that's pretty much true. Cats will pee about four times a day, some more depending on how much hydration they're getting in their diet and some less, but that's normal. So if, as you're tracking, what's happening in the litter box and you wanna know what's normal for baseline, should be looking at about four times a day. And a cat will poop one to two times a day. Again, depending on what you're feeding them and, and that sort of thing. Mine goes once a day, he's, but he's fed a raw diet. So that's, that's probably more natural to a cat in the wild because I feed him a diet that is much more natural to a to an outdoor cat species. He gets raw rabbit. So urination versus spraying. There's a difference. And this is what it what it looks like, what the difference is. Usually when we're dealing with urination issues, you're going to see a puddle on the floor. It's almost always on horizontal surfaces. And when we see spraying issues, it's usually more vertical on a wall or on the back of the couch or, or things like that. Um, and, and yes, both female and male cats spray. I had a case where a lady brought a, a feral cat home uh, from the shelter and was you know feeding it outside and that kind of thing was gonna keep it outside. And her indoor cats, she fed her cats on the kitchen counter right next to the refrigerator. And one of her female cats, Calico, would just get up on that counter. In fact, she did it in front of me while I was there. <laughs> and there was a window to the outside right there. And this cat gets up on the, on the counter, looks out the window, goes over to the refrigerator and just sprays, just like a male cat, right on the side of the refrigerator. So yes, female cats spray also. It is not just a male cat thing. Yes, cats who are altered spray. Um, typically, if they are spayed or neutered young, neutered in particular young, then they won't develop that as an issue, but you have a much higher percentage of chance of a, of a male cat who is an adult who was, you know, neutered late in life, you know, had developed spraying habits prior to being adopted, they're much more likely to be spraying. But this will kind of tell you the, the differences. There are four main issues that cause inappropriate litter box use. And I love this topic. And the reason why I love this topic is because it's the most black and white cat issue that there is. It is the one that I can give you a pretty definite roadmap of how to solve. I, I don't know that I've ever had a case. I have one really, really tough case right now of a defecation outside the litter box, which we've been working on for a while that we're kind of stuck at, but I can't think of a, a going outside the litter box issue that we haven't fixed because it's the easiest behavior issue to fix. So the first is medical. There's something medically going on with the cat. The second is territorial. And the third is trauma, or stress, or a loss of security in, in the home environment. And the last one is dislike for the litter box. So if a cat's going outside the box, it's gonna fall most generally in, I don't wanna say one of these four because sometimes there can be multiple things going on. It can be a dislike for the litter box, and a territorial reason, or it can be a trauma event and a territorial. So it can, sometimes there can be things going on in multiple issues, but these are the four reasons that cats go outside a litter box. You wanna take a methodical approach to solving litter box issues. And by that, I mean, we wanna change just one thing at a time. There's a thing called the 
just change one thing at a time principle. And what that means is you get the hypothesis of what the issue is. So you say, I think it's a dislike for the litter box is the most likely, but it could also be territorial. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take one variable, which let's say is a, a dislike for the litter box. And so I'm gonna change one thing about that litter box. And then I'm gonna monitor the results I, I supply my clients with a litter box tracking form that, that says, you know, the date and where did it go? Was it urine or defecation and which box was it in or was it out of the box? And if it was out of the box, where was it? So we, we track the results, but we try to tweak just one thing at a time, certainly one thing in those areas so that we can see what results we're getting and what's working and what's not working, that's gonna tell us a lot. So medical, let's talk about medical. You wanna rule out medical first. Um, things that could be medical issues that are causing um, these behaviors. And, and you know, the reason we rule out medical first is because you know, all those other things, territorial trauma, dislike for the litter box, we can tweak all of that all day long. But if your cat's having a medical issue that's causing it to go out of the litter box, none of that is going to affect it. In fact, it might make it worse and more complicated. So if we suspect that there's anything medical going on, we want to get that resolved first. Kidney disease is probably the most common reason that cats will urinate outside the litter box. You know, urinary tract infections, bladder stones, crystals, loss of bladder control, um, diarrhea or constipation for defecation outside the box, arthritis because it hurts to get in the box, um, GI pain issues, any kind of gastro, tummy, things that are going on down there pain in the feet um, from declawing, diabetes can cause litter box issues, cancer can cause litter box issues. And so we want to get that fixed first before we ever start diving into the other issues. So some of the indicators, how do we know? How do we know we, you know, how do, when I said, if we suspect that there's a medical issue, well, how do, how do we suspect? What do we see in the litter box? Well, what we see is the cat might take a long time in the box. It goes in and it, it's digging, 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 then takes a long time to go, turns around, digs some more, tries again. It could smell the box and then leave. Um, digging a lot in and out of the box repeatedly. It goes into the box and it goes, and then it darts out really quick. And it's straining to go. That's another indicator. Or yowling while it's going. I had a, I had a client that had an inappropriate urination case and and we were just sure. She said, oh no, I took my cat to the vet and there's nothing wrong with it. And so I know it's not a, a, you know, any kind of medical issue. It has to be something else. And this cat, these poor people, this cat was just going all along their dining room wall. I mean, it, it was a mess. Baseboards were ruined, carpets were ruined. And so we started by moving litter box over there to where the cat was going. And it wasn't making any difference. Cat was going, would just go next to the litter box. So I said, let's put in a camera. I want to see what's happening. So they put in a camera and they would record footage and send it to me. And sure enough, this cat would, it would go in just like this cat in this picture and it would smell around in the box. And then it would turn around and go three feet away and go somewhere else. And then if it did go in the box, it would squat to go and then it would just run out really fast. It was all very classic indicators of medical issues. And so I pushed her and said, you, you've got to have your vet dig deeper, you know, and, and if we can't get that vet to dig deeper, we need to we need to go to another vet. And sure enough, the vet did some extra tests and this poor cat, you know, was having a urinary tract infection 
and got the cat some antibiotics and was good to go. Fix the problem, the rest of the problem. The other indicator would be they're just going where they are, which you know could be an issue of, of loss of bladder control. So what do we do to treat this? Well, the obvious thing is you visit your vet and the vet's likely gonna wanna do blood work, especially if it's a, a older, middle age or older cat, because we wanna be looking for diabetes and renal issues and things like that in blood work. They might do an X-ray or a sonogram looking for crystals in the bladder. Um, they could be X-raying feet if you have a declawed cat because bone spurs that develop a huge number of declawed cats end up with bone spurs over time. And you just can't amputate a joint and not expect there to be bone spur growth in there. And so what happens is the cat goes into the litter box and there's pain associated with the feet. And they say, ah, every time I go in that box, it hurts. So I'm gonna go over there. And that's typically the same line of thought if the cat's constipated and goes in the box and they're like, oh, that hurts then they're gonna go somewhere else. Anytime they associate pain with the litter box, they're gonna find somewhere else to go. Um, Anti-inflammatory. So a lot of inflammation can cause litter box issues. So you might explore, there's some over-the-counter anti-inflammatory treatments that are, that are good. Um, Fortiflora is another really good thing if the, if the cat is constipated or you know or having fortiflora as a probiotic so it puts healthy probiotics in their um, digestion system it's always good to to use that on cat's food that's having trouble pumpkin is another option my cat would never eat canned pumpkin and i found some powdered pumpkin on amazon it's for pets and it's powdered pumpkin that works real well and they tend to have less of a of a dislike for that. The Fortiflora though is really good. They use, um, they use um, brewer's yeast in there, malt flavoring, which cats love. So, you know, the only caution with Fortiflora is your cat might get addicted to it and not eat its food when you stop putting it on there. I know if my cat's getting finicky at all, I just put some Fortiflora on there and he eats it right up. Um, Omega-3s help a lot. Any kind of fish oil and increase those omega-3s, that'll help move things through if we're expecting, you know, any kind of, um, uh, of defecation issues or, um, you know, constipation and things like that. And introduce a new litter box later. And this is real important because if your cat associates the litter box with pain and that's why they're going somewhere else and you change out the litter box before you have fixed the medical issue then you are going to have a problem because the cat's going to associate that new litter box with pain also so you change out the litter box after well after that medical issue has been resolved if we have two things going. So I wanna talk a little bit about food and nutrition because it can simulate medical issues. And I wanna tell you how. It's why I always ask people when we're talking about litter box issues, what do you feed your cat? I've had several people go, well, what does it matter? We're talking about the litter box. Well, it matters because it can be like a medical issue because lack of proper nutrition and hydration, very importantly, creates a concentrated urine. Think about it like when you are, you know, very dehydrated, you let yourself get super dehydrated and you go to the bathroom and your urine is very concentrated and it can burn and you have a burning sensation and you may not have any bacteria in the, in the urine and it may not be a urinary tract infection, but it could be just that you're so dehydrated, it's uncomfortable. And that can happen with cats too, if they're dehydrated. Um, it can also cause constipation, lack of hydration. Um, it can cause diarrhea, believe it or not, and inflammation in the body. So what do you feed your cat if, if you're having these kinds of troubles? Well, cats are obligate carnivores. 
who need nothing more than meat and water. Now, they also need bones and organs and things like that in order to um, have a complete and whole diet. But I wanna talk about what most people feed their cats is kibble, dry food. It dehydrates cats, it mildly dehydrates them. And the reason is, if you think about what they eat in the wild, look at this little um, dish down here of meat and this one of dry kibble, the meat is just like us. It's like any other being, like a cat's natural prey. It's going to have almost 90% water content in it, where this has absolutely none, right? So the other thing about dry food is it contains the absolute minimal amount of required fat and protein and minerals so that they can call it a food. But it, that doesn't really reflect the bioavailability of those ingredients to cats or the quality of those ingredients, right? Because in dry food, they've got to bake it. Even if they started out with filet mignon chopped into little pieces, by the time they bake it at 170 degrees for as long as they do to make dry kibble out of it, well, it's, it, it's no longer that quality ingredient that you put in on the front side. It also creates different intestinal microbes that are less healthy for your cat than a moist diet. It leads to obesity and urinary tract disease because if you feed only dry food, you're keeping your cat mildly dehydrated their entire lives. And renal disease is the number one medical cause of death in cats. Why? Because so many people feed dry food. I recommend that you don't feed any more than 40% of your total cat's intake of dry food. Actually, I, I, I don't feed my cat dry food at all, not a single kibble ever. He only gets fresh, raw food. Um, and that's because it's the healthiest thing that I can feed him. Dry food contributes to what's called stress-induced cystitis and chronic digestive upsets. There's a lot of allergens in dry food. So what do we need to feed? Hydrated wet food, small meals. And when I say hydrated wet food, I mean canned food. Feed your cat canned food. You don't have to feed uh, raw like I do. You can, it's great. Um, there are some transitions things. I think we're gonna do one of our seminars this year is gonna be on nutrition. We'll dedicate more to that, but I wanted to hit the high spots here since this is such an important part of kind of falling under that medical component of what could be going on. I've had many cases where all we did was switch the diet and it fixed the litter box issue. So fed in small meals, fed frequently throughout the day. And you wanna make sure you limit magnesium and phosphate in a cat's diet. Those are really hard on the kidney, especially if you have, have older cats. Um, clean, fresh water always. And by that, I, I don't mean fountains and I'll tell you why. If you have ever gone to your cat's bowl to refill it and you rub your finger in the bowl and it's slimy, I mean, that you could have replaced it yesterday and it's slimy today. And that's because cats have so much bacteria in their mouth and they drink out of the bowl and some of that bacteria gets in the bowl and it immediately makes that slime on the bowl surface, which is why I don't like fountains. A lot of cats like running water, but the problem is I can't get that slime out of the pump. Every time I go to clean that, you know, I, I can't, I just can't manage cleaning a fountain every day because you got to take the thing all apart and it's just a mess. And um, so if your cat likes running water, turn on the sink for it, but <laughs> make sure that you're washing out your water bowl daily and making sure that your cat's got fresh water always. Um, why is my screen sharing paused? It says your screen sharing is paused. There we go. Um, use a phosphate binder. If your cat has uh, kidney issues or a history of kidney issues or is over 10 years old, or if you have fed your, you know, your cat, your older cat dry food, it's most, most of its life, then I always say, 
do the you know preventative thing and go ahead and get some it's called a pactin it's available on amazon it doesn't have much of a flavor and just mix it into the canned food because that's a phosphate binder so that will help them process process that phosphate so i also want to talk about undetected pain cats are absolute masters of disguising pain you would never know if a cat had pain most of the time. By the time a cat is screaming out in, for help in pain, it's often too late. I attended a seminar recently with um, uh, a veterinary, actual a veterinary behaviorist. There are not many of those across the country. And we were talking specifically about litter box issues. And she ran through all the things I'm going to tell you today. And the bottom line of her case studies were that there's undetected pain in cats. Vets will tell you, it's very, very, very hard to figure out if a cat's feeling pain and where it's feeling pain and what's causing it. So don't ever underestimate that there's pain going on, even though the vet has already ruled out all of those other things we talked about. And so if we fix all these other things we're going to talk about and we're still having trouble, then I think we might have some undetected pain going on and other things to look for, you know, decreased appetite or decreased activity, obviously litter box issues that we're talking about now, trembling, irritability, excessive grooming, squinting. Sometimes that's all you see is the cat just kind of squints a little bit, tucked body, you know, they sleep tucked or Curly paws tucked straight on top of themselves, tail wrapped in tightly, restlessness, increased vocalization, um, scratching without touching their skin. I thought that was a very interesting sign of pain that this veterinary behaviorist um, shared that, you know, seeing your cat just go and it doesn't really scratch its body, it's scratching out here in the air. So those are some things to, to watch for. Territorial. Let's go to the second issue is overcrowding of cats or and or people in the house, um, bullying between cats, lack of resources is the biggest one, outside cats, seeing cats outside, a new cat or a new dog or a new tarantula or whatever it is, any kind of pet in the house, um, new baby and unrecognition, aggression between cats is also things that are territorial that cats deal with. So when I have a case of litter box issues, I'm also asking a lot of questions about the other members of the house. Who else lives there? People and, and pets. And how do the cats act with one another? Because um, I wanna know whether there's some bullying, maybe even some just silent, subtle bullying between the cats going on. And I look at all the resources that are in the house, not just litter boxes, but all the resources that might cause conflict if cats felt like there wasn't enough. And then I usually ask things like, do you have outside cats? Are there community cats that go across your yard that you see from time to time? And you can tell when your cat sits at the window and stares out there and sometimes a tail will be swishing. Maybe you're not seeing outside cats, but they could absolutely be there. So what are some of the indicators that there's territorial issues going on that aren't quite this obvious, right? <laughs> Perimeter placement of the urine and feces. When the cats are urinating under windows, and by doors to the outside or pooping by windows and doors. That's what we call perimeter placement. If they don't cover their excrement, so they go to the litter box and they're pooping in the litter box. Let's say you're having a peeing outside the litter box issue, but then in the litter box, when they poop, they don't cover it. That tells me that a cat is feeling insecure about its territory. Because in the wild, they, first of all, they use, they use urine and feces around the perimeter of their territory to say, this is my territory. 
kind of like flags, you know, when you're building a new house and you flag off the corners, well, that's what a cat's doing with its urine and feces. It's saying, this area is mine. And it could be what they're doing in your home if they're seeing cats outside. And when they're in the wild and they don't cover their poop, that's left as a clear sign to the neighboring cats. I want you to get a really good whiff over there because this is my territory. On the other hand, when they cover their excrement, they're hiding the odor from potential predators. So those are the two behavioral differences there. Of course, obvious agitation between the cats, you know, like we're seeing here in this picture. Spraying is a territorial indicator. Um, cats usually won't spray if it's a medical issue. They usually won't spray if it's a litter box dislike, but they absolutely will spray if they feel like there's some invaders or potential invaders in their territory. Blocking. So what I meant by subtle signs of bullying, I was at a, a house once that had litter box issues and there, there were issues with the litter box itself, but I watched one of the cats just lay across the living room floor where I was sitting in the living room talking to the cat parents and the other cat who was peeing in the closet of the owners comes walking through the room, head low, tail low, head, you know, head was kind of on the same plane with the body as was the tail. Like the, normally if a cat's confident and not feeling challenged, its head's gonna be higher than the body. So cat was, heads was low, walking through, kind of slowed down, made eye contact with the cat that was just laying in the middle of the floor and walked around the cat by the wall, kept his eye on the cat the whole time, went around them to go in the kitchen. That's how you know that one cat is bullying another. Very, very subtle blocking things. And you know, if you didn't know it, no hissing, no swatting, nothing like that going on. Just very subtle, I'm gonna go way over here to get around that cat because I'm afraid it's gonna get me or you know, something's gonna happen if I go too close to it. And bullying, of course, you'll see cats you know, for dominance gestures, bullying with maybe playing a little more aggressive than the other cat likes it, following or shadowing another cat. So they'll be always following anywhere that cat goes, got a little shadow, just follow and sit. May not, may not engage the cat in any issues or fighting, but will follow the cat around. Those are some things we talk about and look for as indicators that there's territorial things going on. So if you're having those things, what do we do? What kind of treatment plans do we suggest? Well, the first thing, obviously, if there's a new pet in the house, we want to make sure we have a proper introduction process. And that goes for pets or babies. And um, we did a, a seminar on that already for Dallas Pets Alive. And I have that up on my YouTube channel. So if you if you didn't see that, go there and look at it because we're not going to actually go through what that process is today. Obviously, if overcrowding is an issue, you know, we talk a lot about uh, appropriate resources when it comes to cats feeling comfortable in their environment, especially with litter box issues. And if you have, you know, more cats than you have the ability to have resources for in your square footage, then maybe you need to think about reducing the number of cats. I'm never one to suggest that, you know, I, I tell people what they need to accommodate all of the cats they have. And, you know, if they come to that conclusion on their own, then, you know, that, that is certainly something that helps. Um, block the view to the outside is another thing that we do. There's this wonderful um, static cling frosted film. And I recommend you put it on 18 to 24 inches on windows that cats can see out to block the outsides. I had a, I, I have a photograph that's very funny of a, a couple down in Kessler Park, that beautiful home, all windows on the back of their house their cats were urinating all along that back windows and I suspected other cats. And I'm sitting there talking to them and I look over and sure enough, here's the neighbor cat just sitting out there 
staring in the window about 10 feet outside the window <laughs> and it's like you know and then we had to discuss how are we going to block view access to all of that and of course you have to block access to the backyard to keep the cats from crossing and that's a whole nother uh, discussion but preparing for vet visits so that there is no unrecognition aggression when the cats get home and I have a podcast I did recently called Unrecognition Aggression on Cat Talk Radio. And I suggest that everybody listen to that before you take a cat to the vet or out for grooming or anything where you're leaving one cat at home and removing one from the environment. Uncover the litter boxes. Now, this is important under territorial because... Remember when we started out and I said that cats don't go in holes or caves because they never know what's coming? Well, it's not just predators that they're worried about. It's, it's also other cats that may be coming up for confrontation. So if you have a covered litter box and you have multiple cats, cat goes in the covered litter box and doesn't know what's going on out there. And one of the other cats, especially if there's any other bullying going on, one of the other cats may be there waiting in ambush. So they don't feel real secure in covered litter boxes from a territorial standpoint. Number of boxes. Remember we talking about resources and having enough litter boxes, enough resources for cats. So that looks like one plus litter box plus numbers of cats. And I get lots of consults where people go, well, but I have four cats. Are you saying I need five litter boxes? And I go, yep. And they go, well, but I live in a one bedroom apartment. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, just telling you what you need. And we have one more than numbers of cats so that that subtle bullying that's going on, that cat can't possibly lay in the path of the litter boxes because they're going to be spread out throughout the home. So he can't possibly guard the litter boxes, all the litter boxes at the same time. So it gives all the cats an opportunity to go in peace somewhere in the house. You want to locate the litter boxes in a quiet place with two escape routes. Now, again, that's very important when you're having territorial issues, because if a cat feels threatened, he's got to be able to have a way out. You don't want to put a litter box in a hole. Well, I had a lady that said, oh yeah, my litter boxes are uncovered. And then when I got there, she had taken a, a cabinet, a lower cabinet and made a, a little door, a cat door to it. And you know, it was pretty good size under there, but there was only one way in or out of that little room. So that was not compliant with two escape routes. It was an uncovered litter box technically, but there wasn't two ways for the cats to get out. Um, if we're having territorial issues with cats, one of the things that we do is we isolate the cat to a room with a box and see if the cat will use the box. And that tells us without the interference of the other cats, is the cat willing to use the box? That kind of helps us rule out, are we dealing with a litter box issue or are we dealing with a territorial issue? And in some cases, we may have to remove a cat temporarily. The, um, the case I'm dealing with now with the defecation outside the box, I, I, in the end, I, my gut tells me this is gonna be a medical issue that we just haven't uncovered yet, but um, it didn't start until the second cat came into the home and it doesn't happen when we isolate the cat in a room with the litter boxes so what we're going to do in this case is she has a, a place for her cat to go her mom can take the cat the new cat for a couple of weeks while we see how that affects what's been going on so you might have to actually remove one of the cats okay trauma and stress and loss of security. These could be things like a move, a change in family members, you know, divorce, things like that, death, a new baby, abuse, of course, past abuse in a cat, past neglect in a cat, 
And, and trauma is hard to identify, but some of the things that can be change in routine and habits, the cat all of a sudden starts hiding when it's normally very confident and out, a decrease in appetite, aggression to you or the other cats. And this is tricky because everything I've just listed here could also be indicators that there's medical issues going on and maybe territorial issues going on. So there's a lot of questions in order to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, recoiling, you know, from your hands and your touch pulling back from you. So trauma treatment plan looks like creating stability in routine and rituals so that the cat can count on what's happening in the environment and feel in control. Um, you want to move that litter box to a very quiet area where there's not a lot of traffic going on. You might want to confine the cat to a safe room while we're trying to figure out how to make the cat feel more calm and secure in their environment. Increased affection, lots of reassurance, as long as the cat likes that. Now, if the cat doesn't like affection and touch, then that's just gonna be adding to the stress. So you only increase affection if that cat seems to be having comfort leaning into pets and things like that. Lots of reassurance from you. Positive reinforcement, very, very, very good at this particular time, right? So cat does something good, it purrs, it, it shows calm, and then its favorite treat. You give it its favorite treat when it's showing signs of, of calm. Counter conditioning, <laughs> which is basically we are, you know, we're pairing whatever that scary stimulus is with something really wonderful, deli turkey, lick and lap, something like that. Um, lots of prey play for cats who don't like to be touched and they're not going to get reassurance after, you know, from you touching them and petting all over them, then prey play with them because they like that. And that actually can reduce a lot of stress and make them feel more confident in themselves. All right. The big one litter box dislike. Don't you love her little face? She's like, ooh. <laughs> So size of the box is an issue. Um, the box needs to be one and a half times the length of the cat from the tip of the nose to the base of the tail. Shape of the litter box. Some cats have shape preferences. Style, meaning, you know, robotic, self-cleaning, covered, that kind of thing. Quantity, we discussed location where you're putting the boxes, the kind of litter that you're using, the depth of the litter, and the cleanliness of the box, a big one. So what are some indicators that it could be a dislike for the litter box? They go near the box. So the cats that are going right outside the box, like this cat, if this cat was actually peeing, you would say this cat goes in there and goes right outside the box when in reality it has no choice because this box is way too little. Inconsistent use of the box. So the cat uses the litter box, you know, some days and some days it doesn't. That is an indicator that it's a litter box issue. Um, uses one of the boxes. If you have multiple boxes, it may tend to use one box more than the others. Now that can also be a territorial issue. So you kind of got to be careful, but digs and then leaves, again, could also be medical, but very likely a pointing to a, a litter box dislike. Excrement on the edge of the box, again, because of size probably, smells the box and then leaves. So what do we do to treat this? One and a half times the length of the cat. Cat's gotta have room to turn around fully in the box. So, you know, most cats are, you know, 16 inches or so long from their nose to the base of their tail, which means you've gotta have a 24 inch litter box and good luck finding one of those out there. 
that's not a kiddie pool. So go to the dollar store and get a, you know, one of those under bed storage boxes. That's what we use for our travel little box because then it has a lid to it. I don't use the, the lid of course in the house, but I put the lid on it to go take it to the car and back and in and out of hotel rooms and things like that. But size of litter boxes is huge for cats. It needs to be simple, no gimmicks. Just like that box as I showed you, just a, a big wide pan. That particular one is a puppy piddle pan. I think they're also marketing it as a senior cat's box because it's nice and low. They don't have to you know, do anything crazy to get in and out, it's just step right in. None of the robotic things, cats hate that stuff. None of the top loading things, none of that stuff, just simple needs to be accessible without blocking from the other cats. So again, not in a, not in a small closet or a pantry. It needs to be safe. So it has to be uncovered so they don't feel unsafe. The other thing a covered litter box does is it concentrates the ammonia particles in the air hugely in there. And cats' noses are so much more sensitive than ours. So they go in and it just, it burns their nose. It smells horrible, even if you're keeping that box clean. So you wanna uncover it so that you um, don't have that, so that they're not, not suffering from that. Located in a quiet area, you want to distribute the litter boxes throughout the house. They can't all be glommed up in one area. A very sandy litter box texture. Remember when we started out, cats prefer a sandy texture. So I don't, I don't like pellets. I don't recommend pellets. Some cats will use them just because they love you and you haven't given them any other choice, but they prefer a sandy texture. Unscented litter, again, their noise, noses are very, very sensitive and any kind of chemicals added to the litter for scent or you know, covering up their odor is, is not healthy for them. You don't need more than about two inches of litter depth. I know a lot of people put four or five inches in there and maybe that's because you think you don't have to scoop it as often because it's really deep. And when, it, and when it clumps, it's easier to get the clumps out if it's, it's real deep, but you really don't need more than about two inches. And sometimes, you know, cats have a real preference for litter depth. It's either too thick or it's too shallow. And, and we can kind of tell what they're going on as to what they prefer. You got to scoop your litter box multiple times a day. And you know why I tell you multiple times a day? Because you might do it once a day if I tell you you have to do it multiple times a day. But you really have to do it multiple times a day because a cat does not want to step on a soiled area in the litter box in order to go. They just won't do it. If they look in there and all they can see is you know, areas of peep and poop and it's all, you know, they're going to go, nope. Just like when you walk into a public restroom and if there's, you know, stuff in the toilet or on the toilet seat, you're going, nope, I'll find another stall to go to. Same way with your cat. I scoop my litter box probably three times a day. I just make it habit of doing. Um, the box needs to be replaced because it begins to hold odors. And so you wanna replace your box about every six months. You wanna wash your box. I wash mine about every two weeks with one cat in the household. And I do that by dumping the litter. And then I use Dawn dish detergent, no bleach, nothing real smelly, just Dawn, nice mild. I, I have a toilet bowl brush I use just for cleaning my litter box. And I scrub the Dawn, scrub it all out, rinse it out, dry it real good, refill it with the two inches of litter about every two weeks. This is an example of an ideal litter box setup. Um, this is actually my utility room. I have changed this setup a little bit since then, but you get the idea. These are scratching pads, posts, not, uh, not litter out here. The point is that it's in my utility room. And if I don't want to look at it, if that's the reason people prefer covered litter boxes, I don't want to look in there. I don't want to see the stuff. Well, 
mask it off with a screen or put it in a corner of a room and put a chair in front of it or a TV cabinet or something like that, long as there are two exit routes. So you can see that there's clearly, this is open to the top and the cat can go in either side. It's got plenty of exit escape routes. I like the Litter Genie. I use Litter Genie XL. So I just keep that right there next to my litter box. Um, I also have plugged in over here a, um, black and decker bus duster or you know and i also just kind of if there's litter tracked out i use that you can see i keep it clean so that's the ideal litter box so if we have a cat with litter box issues and we're not sure say my litter boxes are uncovered they're plenty big they're spread out into good places in the home then we might do what's called a litter box buffet. So we're gonna isolate the cat to a room and we're gonna give them this buffet. We're gonna monitor the activity. And so what we do with a buffet is we'll use, depending on what the person's using as the current litter, always one of these boxes has the current litter and then we'll try a pellet. We might try a, you know, news or one of those and then we'll put a, a piddle pad in one even too just to see what the cat likes and then we have a form that we keep track litter box one two three four or outside the box and we see what's happening and there may be as i've said all along overlapping indicators of what's going on here right so the cat could be going in and out of the box which would indicate medical um, you could have cats outside, which would indicate maybe a territorial issue. You could have the cat going right outside the box and all of these things could be happening at the same time. And so those might be indicators that are in a lot of different categories. So then we're not fully sure. So it's kind of like you have to be a crime scene investigator when you're dealing with litter box issues. And you gotta take a lot of things into consideration. The environment, what's going on in the house, around the cat, um, what's going on outside the house that the cat can see, what's going on in the relationship with the family and the caregivers with the cats, what changes have happened in that cat's life and environment recently. What's the history of the cat? How old is the cat? What is its medical history? What are relationships like with other pets in the home and the people? What kind of body language are you seeing? What kind of diet does the cat have? There's lots and lots of things that you have to look at. The timing, when does it happen? Is it always at the same time of the day? Is it always on Tuesdays and Thursdays? You know, when does it happen? Is it in the middle of the night only? Those things will tell you a lot. So this is my email. If you wanna take note of that before we go to questions and I quit screen sharing. And um, you can always contact me after this session. I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can do questions. I saw some things in the chat, but I wasn't monitoring that as I was going along. So if you have questions, just uh, let's see, what do we have over here? Where do you purchase raw rabbit? I buy Primal Frozen Raw Rabbit uh, for cats, and I don't get the little nibbles. They come in a they have two kinds. I like the ones that are brick style and they're frozen. You can't order it online because it's a frozen product. So usually um, not Petco, PetSmart, unfortunately, but more of your high quality pet food stores will have it. Be careful when you transition to raw because it's not something you can just do cold turkey. Um, you can email me and I'll send you the transition schedule or I've got a podcast actually coming up that's dedicated just to transitioning your cat to new food. Does someone do some dry food help maintain healthy teeth? You know that is a myth that dry food helps maintain their teeth. Nothing helps maintain their teeth. That would be like saying if you eat 
you know, lots of crunchy food, it's going to keep plaque from building up on your teeth. It's just not, you're going to get plaque on your teeth, no matter what you eat. And you have to go to the dentist occasionally and have your teeth clean. So your cat does too. What I suggest is giving greenies or treats like that, or better yet, give your cat a raw chicken drumstick, pull the meat off of it, pull all the little tiny bones off of it and let your cat gnaw on that bone that will actually help clean their teeth there is also enzymatic toothpastes where you don't have to brush your cat's teeth you just put the enzymatic toothpaste which comes in malt flavor by the way cats really like it and then you just rub your finger on their teeth and those enzymes go to work um Let's see, what else? What else we got going on here? Could outside squirrels cause it too? Could be, you know, cats don't see good very far, right? They, they, don't, they don't see distances real well. So if they saw a squirrel or certainly a raccoon or a possum or something like that, and then might mistake it for another cat, they're probably gonna think squirrels are prey and be excited about that. If there are other cats in the house, and they want to make a territorial gesture that those squirrels are my squirrels and not your squirrels, then they might go under the window that the squirrels are being seen out of. So that could kind of go, kind of go either way. Bullying each other nowadays. Yeah, that's, that's hard. Let's see, what else? Declawing, what are my thoughts about declawing? Oh my goodness. Um, well, I do not recommend declawing at, at all. In fact, it's illegal in a lot of countries and illegal in several states in the United States. And there's a, a group called the Paw Project. I suggest you look that up. They have a lot of great information there, but basically it's a amputation. It is not a simple, you know, we tend to think from within ourselves like, well, okay, if you took off my nails, it would be horrible, but it wouldn't be the end of the world right? Because your skin would just form over, no big deal. But it's not like that for cats. It's like amputation at this joint here at the end of your finger. And the problem is there's a lot of tiny bones in there. And so when you make that amputation of the end of the toe, it's like cutting the ends of the toes off, then bone spurs are going to happen. And, and that's a problem that causes pain and uh, can absolutely cause litter box issues. Um, so no, I, I do not uh, recommend declawing at all. And if you have a cat that's already declawed, I recommend taking them in for an x-ray. A lot of vets are doing corrective surgery nowadays. And, um, you know, these are things that can crop up later in life because they'll start to get arthritis in their feet and the bone spurs will happen later. So if you say, well, my cat's been declawed his whole life, why would there be litter up box issues happening just now? Well, it could be because those bone spurs are just now starting to grow. So, you know, if you have a declawed cat next time you're in, have, ask your vet, do they do corrective surgeries and uh, have them x-ray. All right, what if you're dealing with a health issue and no longer have the bandwidth or income to do all of these things? Yeah, um, that happens. And I suggest you reach out to, you know, a, a good, reliable, reputable rescue that maybe specializes in you know, taking in cats with, with medical issues and, uh, and see if you can find a way to rehome the cat if you can no longer deal with it. Because I get it, that happens sometimes. Do litter mates tend to bully each other? Mine do, and one always has had litter box issues because he's very insecure. They can, litter mates can be the best of buddies or they can be just like two totally strange cats. Um, I've seen it go both ways. So I don't think the fact that they're siblings has really a lot to do in, in most cases with, with territorial issues um, and, and battling there. But um, if you do some of these things we talked about in terms of making sure that they both feel like there's plenty of resources, then that'll help that insecurity. Maybe take the bullying cat and put it in the sanctuary room by itself and let your insecure cat have the rest of the place and the people to itself for some time. Um, that, that should help. I have several really good podcasts on, on how to make cats feel more secure. 
I have three cats. Someone has started peeing about two feet outside the box in the last month. Not sure who it is and there haven't been any changes in our lives lately gotten them all seen by a vet, would you suggest the next step isolating them? I would suggest the next step to that would be make certain that you've got litter box dislike handled. Um, make sure you've got four litter boxes and they're all around the house so that there's no silent bullying going on. And I would suggest putting some cameras up so that you can isolate who's doing it. And, um, you know, sometimes if, if so like I'm saying, I can't stress enough, vet goes, yeah, I don't see anything wrong, but yet they haven't done a real deep dive. Sometimes we can't afford for them to do all the things we really need to do to figure out what the problem is. So start at the litter box, do all the things that is on that litter box checklist. Um, I have a link to that on my website and I have it in a PDF. So if you, uh, if you want that, just email me and I'm happy to, to send it to you so I don't have to try to remember all those things. And then, and then yes, once you've put in those cameras and you've figured out it's cat A, then isolate cat A to a sanctuary room and see if he'll use the litter box with one of the boxes. And if he's not using the litter box while isolated, then do the litter box buffet. And if he's still not using the box, then I would say it's time to get back to, to the vet with some more digging. Do they develop bone spurs if laser method is used for declawing? Does declawing have psychological issues for a cat when they discover they can't climb on things? Yes, I believe bone spurs, I'm, I'm clearly not a vet, but um, I believe they do develop bone spurs even with the laser method. And yeah, I don't know about psychological issues. I mean, I think it depends so much on what's going on in the rest of a cat's environment and relationships with their people. Um, a lot of declawed cats climb just fine, climb you know as well as regular cats. So I'm not sure that they might be a little more insecure. They know they can't defend themselves if there's multiple cats in the environment. One of mine started peeing by the back door after I introduced them to the great outdoors. Was this a mistake? <laughs> yeah, if they go outside and they see other cats out there and they figure out I was out there and I saw a cat, then I got to pee here to mark my territory. So it's probably because if they went outside, they saw another cat or smelled another cat. Um, I never think it's a mistake to introduce cats to the outside. I have a cat run. So the cat has a door. It can go outside and an enclosed cat run at any time. Um, we take him out on walks on his harness and leash and in a stroller. And he, he loves going on hikes and things like that. So I, I never think that's an issue. But I would start looking at the cats that are outside or that they may be seeing outside. Does feel away help with cat cohesiveness? Um, feel away, yes, can help. I think it works on about 80% of cats. I, I've always been surprised that synthetic anything works with you know, a wild animal, but feel away has scientifically been proven to show less stress in cats. So absolutely, it certainly can't hurt. So I would try it. It's not a magic wand for fixing all problems, but it's a good layer of problems. And uh, Janae says she's, she's running, she's got a, somewhere to be, and she put a, a link to a, a post-workshop survey in our chat session. So if uh, everybody would please do that and, um, and do the survey, and of course, check out the Cat Behavior Solutions website and Facebook. Um, we put post lots of great stuff there and certainly Cat Talk Radio because there's a, a lot of lot of information. And if you're not already fostering, she also put a link there um, of how to uh, get in touch with them for fostering. All right. Do you love anti-icky poo cleaner as much as I do for cleaning cat messes? Well, I prefer live pee free and I'll tell you why. Because most of the 
the stuff, the, the, the enzyme based cleaners is what I'm trying to say. Enzymes are basically bugs. They're bacteria that eat other bacterias. And the problem is they don't live forever. They don't have a forever shelf life. So when you spray that enzyme product on excrement or urine, it's only going to work as long as those enzymes are alive. And when the enzymes are dead and they're no longer eating the bacteria, then the odor returns. Whereas an ion brace product like Live Pee Free, the um, urine is a negative ion and the product is a positive ion. And when you apply it, when it comes in contact with it, it totally neutralizes that molecule forever. So the odor is gone for a long time. We sell it on our website at the catbehaviorsolutions.org. It's in the store. It's, uh, we sell it in a you know, regular squirt bottle size and then a refill two liters. So I, I prefer that over any enzyme. And I'm not, I don't know what anti icky poo, if that's enzyme based, probably is, but okay. <clears throat> It says, we talked about this four years ago with our adopted Persian, did as you suggested, but not much success. She's doing many of the things you mentioned outside the litter box or running after defecation. I'm at a loss. She was declawed when we got her. We've noticed many disruption in routine does cause more of a problem. There are only two of us and we're in our seventies. So not much excrement here you know a lot of times if you have a cat that is uh displaying stress like that you know sometimes we get to a point where we do a trial run of gabapentin gabapentin is a, a prescription that the vet can give you that does two things in high enough doses it helps to mask any pain it helps to reduce pain and it also reduces anxiety so if we've kind of already hit everything we can do where you're doing all the right litter box things you've got the right diet going on there's no stress in the home and the cat is you know maybe suffered from some previous traumas uh, declawing can be a trauma um, and no telling you know kittenhood and things like that then Oftentimes I'll suggest you get with your vet and I'm happy to work with your vet as well and explain what we've tried and, and suggest a trial run of gabapentin. And that will help us to know um, what's going on. That'll just help further eliminate some things. Okay, somebody else says I'm a professional pet sitter. So attend this to help some clients. Great, a lot of this I knew, but also learned to not. Good, I'm glad you did. Personally, not having litter box issues with my cats, but wanted to help others. Thanks so much. Thank you for attending today. <laughs> We've tried both pellets and clay sand next to each other. They prefer the clay sand. Is this because of the tactile the sand? And what litter do you recommend? That's a very good question. Yes, I'm not surprised. They typically will choose um, clay sand or sandy texture over pellets. I uh, use right now, and I say right now because I do tend to bop around trying new products, but I use Tidy Cats 24-7 clean, so it has no scenting products in it at all, no, no chemical scents. It has little tiny black dots of charcoal, and the charcoal is what helps control the odor, but because I scoop the litter box three times a day for one cat, there's very little odor. And because I feed raw diet, you'll notice when you feed a raw diet, their excrement has very little smell. It looks like bobcat poop. So it's very dry, even though they're on a more hydrated diet, their body is actually using all of that. And then they go very dry, non-stinky type poops. Um, so yes, to answer your question, it is a tactile thing that's just in their DNA, what they prefer. So I would try the 24 seven clumping clean. Okay, and would pee free, no, live, live pee free, L-I-V-E, live pee free. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Those were great questions. No more questions? Okay. And Yoli, Yoli made it from Milan today. Hi, Yoli. I'm glad everybody to come today. So thanks for- Hi, everybody. Listening. There you are. Hi, Yoli. We hi, just did, hi, hi. We just did your, uh, your suggested podcast. So oh. watch, watch Cat Talk Radio for, uh, for your upcoming podcast you suggested. All right, everybody.
Oh, here's another one. Hold on. I'll go as long as you guys want to, by the way. <laughs> Your thoughts on what causes stomach bug when there are no known changes in the home? Been to the vet and just waiting for symptoms to go away. Hmm, not, not sure. Stomach bugs kind of a big umbrella category. I always recommend trying Fortiflora. Anytime there's any um, intestinal issues or stomach issues, Fortiflora and the pumpkin, like we mentioned, and the omega-3s, all of that can really help. But, um, you know, if maybe they've ingested something, you know, Pico the other day, um, we were at our friend's house. Uh, he came home from the hospital and there were lots of balloons and that, that curling ribbon on the balloons. Well, he loves to eat that stuff. So I had to tie all the balloons up on, you know, lights and chandeliers. And before I could get one tied up, he'd actually eaten some, so, <laughs> and was stopped up. He didn't go for like two days. He was constipated and he was miserable and he didn't feel good. So I had to start just pouring on the Fortiflora and things like that to help move stuff through. So it just kind of depends on what's actually going on for stomach bug. Um, but I'm sure your vet will be able to help you get to the bottom of that. How do we work with you personally? Oh, good question. Well, you can start by, um, if you go to my website, catbehaviorsolutions.org, I do have a tab for consultations and that information is there and you're more than welcome to send me an email, molly at catbehaviorsolutions.org. And uh, thank you, I recommended your website and podcast for her and she was pleased. Oh, good, excellent. Great, 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 great. All right, everybody, if that's it, then we'll, we'll sign off for today and we'll be doing this again next quarter. So um, sign up for our emails if you aren't already receiving the Cat Behavior Solutions emails or Dallas Pets Alive, and uh, we'll let you know um, what we're doing next and when it's gonna be. So thank you everybody for joining today. Really appreciate you being here. Keep calm and purr on, as I say. <laughs>